Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a you. Check it, check it, check it. This is Unique Halls. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing but Irie, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see, see, it up. I that's how you're doing it, it now. See, yes. you get down here in Atlanta, Georgia, and you start getting loose. You understand. <laughs> <laughs> Say, man, we got a special guest in the house today, man. Pastor yeah. JC Wallace. Yes, hey, right. man, so, uh, man, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Nervous, but I'm good. You put your nervous for? You, nervous? you ought to be nervous. Man. You ought to be nervous. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm, I see. Oh, nervous, you didn't say man. you're nervous. Now I'm loving it now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm for that cup. No, I'm just kidding. Come with it. No, no, man. Hey, listen, man. <laughs> this is this is some this we try to make it just a good conversation that we get to have with a good group of people. So that's what Boss Talk 101 is about, man. We've had several ministers on this on this show. Okay. Um so um so many different ones that uh you know, dear friends of mine, um, then some that went, we, we were introduced to. That we introduced to. Them yeah, and they, they became good friends. friends. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, um, so just tell us a little bit about who but, you are. But I want to know one thing first, because I heard your nickname is God's Bullet. Yeah. Where did that <laughs> so, come from? Uh, so that was actually a little Facebook uh, joke or whatever. Um, they was... Um, they they had this like post that was going around that had a whole bunch of different names that uh you know preachers is like you know because you know everybody wants a title right now mm-hmm. so so they had like this list of different names that was going around like God's bullet repentant Judas all this other kind of stuff and so I was just joking her I said you know what I'm God's bullet from here on so ever since then I've been tagging that God's bullet on like my deep posts and stuff like that and it really messes people up wow yeah cool. well go in and tell us about yourself how you were raised um brothers sisters single parent home or both together let us know everything Ooh, that's that's gonna be loaded um well I'm from I'm originally from uh Ohio I was born in South Carolina I'm from Ohio I've been I've been in ministry really since I was eight years old mm-hmm. um I accepted my call to preach at eight um I grew up in a Baptist church. Um, as far as uh, my upbringing, yeah, I was a single parent home. My mom, um, she raised me and um, three of my biological brothers, but she also adopted a, a few other boys also. So it was a lot of us in the house. All boys. All boys, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was the youngest. Um, um, boy. Yeah, I, I, I've been the youngest my whole life until about like last year. Uh, when I finally discarded, you know, learning some different truths and facts about my dad. So it was just like, so, so yeah, I don't know if I'm the youngest, the middle there. child. I don't know where I'm at at the, at the, <laughs> on his side anymore. So yeah, it's just wow. a, you know, pretty, pretty But where was your dad history. during, um, when y'all were growing up? My dad been in jail my whole life. Yeah. Your whole life? My whole life. Yeah. He got out. Um, in fact, he went in like maybe like six days after I was born. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a Navy person. We got relocated to, um to uh illinois navy yeah what did he go to jail for then he, see that's a lot of stuff that i started learning um over the past few years but my dad um he's actually a rapist yeah huh? yeah so yeah it's deep wow it's, it's but a, he was with the navy yeah so he basically you know in the navy you know in the military they they deal with their own crimes the way they deal with him at that time you know um, he had some pending charges, so instead of him, you know, going to jail for it, they relocated him. But like after um, like six days of us being in Illinois, he went out to get me, you know, supposed to be getting me some Similac or whatever, and um, he never came back. And so I kind of find out chick was out sunbathing in her yard, and he made a, made a play at her. So he went in jail. Um, we relocated back to Ohio, where my mom was originally from. He got out when I was like seven. Went back in like a year and a half later for the same thing but just on a different level um by this time he's out of the military so he got to answer the consequences to you know the real legal system so he was like um out in in ohio we got this highway called 270 which is like 285 here that goes around the whole city so 275 he was dubbed as 270 rapists he went on like a spree of different stuff so yeah so his his past has really shaped my life in terms of how i um, handle people. But what I want to go yeah. back to, what, what I didn't like, and I've always, I'm not sort of kind of knew this with the military. It, um, you said that once they knew what was going on in this city, they'll move him. They're going to move him to another city, but you are in charge. You, you, you can go there to the other city and rape somebody again. So 
because you hear about it in the military, especially for females, mm -hmm. the fact that um, you are, um, they get abused, they get yeah. raped by their sergeants, by, you know, their peers, by, you know what yeah. I mean? So, but they're not saying facilitating, but they're moving them to fresh meat, so to say. Absolutely. Um, see, he was in Florida before we was, because I was born in South Carolina. And when I say Island. him, I'm talking about yeah. a lot of uh, yeah, yeah. This people is, who are just like him. This is, this is, this was the culture. I don't know how it is now, but I know um, from, from his experience and my own experience, like he was in Florida. Um, and then we found out that there was a, you know, a little case there that that's why he got transferred to South Carolina. And then the, what, where it became something that was outside of the military's hold is that um, when we moved to Illinois, the, his victim was a civilian. It wasn't somebody who like lived on base or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why he, the different court, you know, kind of handled that situation and he had to actually do jail time behind that. So right now he's doing a bid 15 to 150. He ain't getting out. So, so how long you been hearing about your father being uh, in? Uh, See, all my life, man, most of my, um, most of my, 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 like my mom is the only one that's really been really kind of honest about it, never really going into detail because I think it was a big, um, a big thing for her because, you know, she had to live with some of those experiences as, a, as you know, as his wife, you know, the abandonment behind his crimes. And then when he got out, the fir you know, the first time, when we were in Ohio, he tried to make a play at her, so she never really wanted to talk about it. Um, but for on his side, you know, they've always maintained his innocence, even to this day. Now that I even know the truth, like his sisters and stuff like that, and be like, yeah, you know, we're going to fight this thing. We're going to try to get him out. He got this parole coming up and all this other kind of stuff. Even ask me if I was speaking on his behalf, and I'm just like, nah, bro, nah, uh-uh. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm, I'm a father of five now, and uh, four of my kids are, are girls. And so I take that kind of stuff very serious, you know. And then also when I learned of, you know, um, just him trying to make a play at my mom. And then I also discovered that because of his crimes, you know, I had a sister who um, it, it eventually would be raped and killed herself. So, you know, that really shaped um, a lot of things for me, especially how I interact with women, how I approach um, people who have been in domestic situations, victims and survivors of rape and things of that nature. That's really close and dear to my heart. So, you know, it's just I, I'm I'm a forgiving person uh, and inherently, you know, I, I'm I'm a very big forgiver. But one of the people that's been hardest, my hardest to forgive has Damn. been him um, just simply because of that. You know, what I'm saying and it's not even that he's been absent and locked up his whole life. It's just that, you know, how can you forgive a man who was so, you know, monstrous? You know, yeah. you have to forgive. Yeah. You have to forgive, yeah. not only for him but for yourself. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a daily process. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I forgive, and you know, some days I'm good with it, and um, then some days I gotta forgive again. You know, that's that's it's a repeated process, especially with him, man. Because it's like you know, I gotta look at my mom, I gotta look at my daughters, I gotta look at you know, and and being in the the realm of work that I'm in now as a pastor. Um, my ministry is really geared to the street. So there's a lot of people who deal with this type of stuff, who were brought up in these type of households, who have uncles who have uh, made plays at them, but because of the family unit, they've masked it and hid it and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that, that's why I say it makes forgiveness hard from him because it's some, some days I just have to forgive again. It's so like, you know, because I look at I'm, I, my father is is their uncle. My father is their cousin. My father is their neighborhood, you know, abuser, you know. So it's just, you know, that type of thing. Well, I, I just know that um, when you talk about um, what what your dad done and when I look down that whole path, you know, it's really a situation where you have to feel sorry for a person who goes through that because mm -hmm. the Bible say, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds mm -hmm. and casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalt every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, already that these are spiritual battles. So right. it's hard to look at the person that's having the issue and not, Look at the fact of God told you, he showed you in his word through mm -hmm. Peter, through Paul, through all the different patriarchs of the of the discipleship that was with him through their books. 
mm-hmm. that this is spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. So we cannot focus on the individual. We have to focus on the spirit. Mm-hmm. So the spirit, the Bible says that Jesus said, them that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Mm-hmm. So therefore you cannot get caught up on looking at a person. He said, how can you love a God? Mm-hmm. Whom you've not seen That's and right. hate your brother. That's right. Why does he say this? Because he under you got to understand that the situation that you're looking at is not even the problem. The spirit that you're fighting against mm-hmm. is the problem. That's right. So when you start looking at spiritual warfare. Mm hmm. That's a whole nother level. It is. And that's a whole nother devil. That's right. It's, see, the devil is a celestial being. And therefore, he's not like us. He's not terrestrial. So when you got when you start to look at him. You got to start to fight a spiritual battle right. in order to understand how to win. Right. So it's not your father mm-hmm. that really is the one that's the issue. It's the devil that's operating within mm-hmm. the realm of the right. lifestyle right. that he's affecting. Right. right. So that's how I deal with things. You know, I've had my ups and downs with a lot of different people. I've, I've had situations where I felt people turned their back on me or did me wrong. And, and, and I understand my mom, mom was raped in order for her to be here. And, I, you know, you, you start asking and family members starts to get upset because you start to deal with these different issues that they want to cover up. Nobody right. wants to talk about it just right. like you just right. spoke about. Right. Right. And everybody's hidden. And then one day my auntie gets Alzheimer's and she just tells it all. That's right. <laughs> you right. see what I'm saying? Right. And you're like, what? And she, and she starts to tell it because she can't control it anymore right, right. because it's, it has to come out right. what's done in the dark yeah will truly come to the come light out. yeah so when i look at different things like this i thank god that i had an opportunity to change and if you truly change and you truly believe then you know that whatsoever you that's bound on earth mm-hmm. shall be bound in heaven right whatsoever is loosed on earth shall, shall be, be loosed, loosed in heaven. heaven that's right behold i give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven See, these keys that you have can un- unlock or lock things. Right. So therefore, you have to forgive in order to grow. Right. If you don't, then you will affect your daughters. You will affect whoever's in your life That's because right. that unforgiveness will spring out in a whole That's different right. dynamic and attack your family. That's right. I'm That's just right. hey, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's probably why I got a lot of pastor friends. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see. I can see. But people can't but it was understand the truth, that. Man. People can never understand that um, unless you're in the spirit. Because even I remember when that case in Dallas where um, that police officer came into his apartment thought, thinking it was her apartment and still shot him. Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. I remember that. And that boy hugged. Yes. And the brother. But when they went yeah. to court. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that tripped me out. But, but, but that, <laughs> me that's too. showing, I got that's mad showing too. forgiveness. I got mad. And I know, and I know, I know the book. I know the book. I understood. <laughs> but I didn't understand. <laughs> like, so what, what is it? Uh, nigga, don't hug that. No, nigga, don't, right. do it, don't do it, nigga. But to me, to me, that's the, the, the utmost illustration of forgiveness that a lot of people, when you're in the flesh and you're mad, yeah. you can't feel that but once you get out of that flesh and you really take a look at that you're like man that's fun that was too spontaneous to, to just that was too quick yeah you it would take us a time but, to process but, but you know, that wasn't the only time that i was tripping it was uh remember when they had the shooting when they the dude came up in the church yeah yeah yeah. Uh-huh. you shot all them people mm-hmm. and and all the church members is, is that i watched i was watching a documentary of it <laughs> and all the church members they showed up and they you know they talking they're like you know i forgive you and all this other kind of stuff and i'm sitting there thinking like but then it was the one brother who say? i resonated with he said you know i, I don't know what jesus juice they sitting on, but I ain't got it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's yeah, too yeah, fresh, yeah. you know. It's he was like, fresh. it's too fresh. But you know, I get it. I get it from from a spiritual standpoint. I truly get it. I understand that you know, forgiveness is essentially it's necessary. It's for you. You know what I'm saying? Because people will do you wrong and go about their life and never think about what they right, did. Right. And you the one holding on to it. You the one not progressing, all that kind I of stuff. I agree, but I disagree. It's, it, it, it's not getting you anywhere. No, no, it's just, I, I agree else. with it that it's for you. Right. But I understand also that it holds another individual in a position. Right. So so what I, why I say I don't agree with it is because when you look at a woman that... I, I, it was a story I read a long time ago, and, and it was a woman that used to treat her mama bad every day. Mm-hmm. Her mama was sick. Her mama wouldn't do nothing. She wouldn't, she lay down all the time. 
and she had an illness. Was that that Tyler Perry movie? No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. But check it out, check it out. One day, uh, this, and I'm gonna fast forward the whole story. One day she forgave herself and her mother and her mother started operating totally different mm. because she, like I say, whatsoever you bound on earth, it's, it's, right. you chain that person into yeah, a position. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm mad at you and I don't talk to you, really that's gonna affect us because I don't talk to you now, you don't talk to me. And everywhere we go, we know we don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So now we both caught up with this chain of anger. Absolutely. That stops that person from operating, I, I, I right? I agree with that wholeheartedly. It, it stops yeah, them. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. When I, when I was saying it is for you is that, you know, like I said, there, you know, that's there's a different dynamic relationship when you're talking about a relationship between uh, a child and their parent, you know, or a family member, relative. These are people that you really got to see. You gonna run into them yeah. at some point. But then there's some people that didn't came into your life and they don't went on about their life and you never gonna see them again. True. And so, you know, then when I say that you gotta release that for you, you know, really that's, that's 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 just what it is. And so um, this this is this is where we are. You know, I understand the the spiritual ramifications behind unforgiveness. Um, it really holds you in a bottle. It keeps you in the box and it keeps you from flourishing and progressing in life. Will it make you sick? It will make you sick. <laughs> but see, that's what the thing that people don't realize <laughs> is that, you know, you you fight these spiritual battles and they really do take a toll on your that's physical right. body. That's true. They and really they do. blame it on the illness because they think that's all what it is. But as soon as they forgive mm -hmm. and really release all of that, all of a sudden they're getting better. Yeah. They're that's what I just explained about that woman. Yeah. Because that unforgiveness will hold you back. It and will. Hold, and it'll, it'll it will. Straight. It will hurt you and the person that's that you do. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so we got to, we, we, you know, that's the, 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 the pastor, the teacher, the apostle, the prophet, uh, you know, the evangelist, you know, when you look in Ephesians 4 and 11 and you start to look at these positions that, that, that God has put these gifts in the, in the dif different individuals, um, and they start to permeate. Do you feel like in today's society that that things are happening the way they should be doing in the body of Christ? Man, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, uh, you gonna do this to me? Okay, no, I do not. I, I, I absolutely not. Absolutely not, man. This, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. This has been. Um, <laughs> This has been the Achilles heel of, of my ministry, man, because I'm looking at it, man, and and um, I, I talk to people all the time, man, and, and, and it's and it's like, I, and I say this vocally, it's like, this is not what God intended, wow. man. This is not what it's supposed to look like. It's not what it's supposed to be like. Um, it's just a, it's a lot of clout chasing. It's a lot of uh, self uh, selfish agendas and self driven ambitions and all that kind of stuff. And it's not about the people anymore, man. It's not about loving people. It's not about seeing people's. First and foremost, it ain't about souls no more. Um, you got we got a whole lot of other stuff going on in the church that we we have really been uh, become unconscious of people and their soul salvation, and that breaks my heart. And I think that that's what makes. Um, what I do in my approach in ministry, you know, so much more important because it's like I genuinely love people when I and I, and I say that to people all the time and they're looking at me and they're like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, no, I want you to understand something. I genuinely love people. My love is automatic. It's, it's like a godly love. It's like it's, it's there. You got it from the get go. If I don't know you, you got it. If I do know you, you got it. If you did me wrong, you still got it. It's just my love is there. I genuinely love people. And because I genuinely love people, it's like I really want to see the progression of people. And I know that that starts with their soul. If I can't help you figure out your soul and getting that thing so right with God and getting you saved and all that kind of stuff, then it kind of makes everything else that I see about you um, all the more impossible for you to accomplish. It's like I, I got to get you to this place first before I can sh show you what I really see, because the things that I see are in spirit. But as long as you operate in a carnal place and, and, and in a natural place, you can't see what I see. So you don't understand the way that I love you because you can't see the way that I love you is from a spiritual perspective. It's like I see you here. I genuinely I, I see your progress. I see your victory. I see your 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 blessedness. I see all these things, but I can't get you to see it until you see that I love you here in the natural and that there's a there's a transition that has to take place in your life. Well, you, you got to understand the reason because it's you're only a planter or mm -hmm. you're only a one that water. 
Right. And it's God to give the increase. That's right. So that's why a lot of times it's in his time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of times we want to see these people. I, my, I got shout out to my brother, you know, my younger brother. You want people to change when you want them to change. Yeah. You but see, God it's not even own, about that. No, 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 I'm just saying. For me, it was. I'm, yeah. I'm not. I'm. I'm just saying. When you when you look at them, you like. I want to see them change, but you stay in prayer for them. You know oh, what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. And, and and you try to wait, and then it seemed like the, the seem like the plan ain't popping up. Yeah. You know. You but but you just got to stay patient. But the thing is, is that and and, and it's it is so much deeper than just me wanting to see them there. It's 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 when you have people who supposedly have light callings and because we're talking about the position of the church and whether or not we see if, if how we see it is how God intended. Um, when you feel like your opposition is the person that's supposed to be working next to you, that's where the biggest issue, because you got, so let's say you got preacher A, you got preacher B. Well, preacher A is preaching one thing. And, they, and, and, and and it's not God-centered. It's not about people. It's not about, it's about things. It's about possessions, about all these things. It's about all these self-driven ambitions and all that kind of stuff. But then you got pre Preacher B, who is, man, I really want to see you change because I realize that your change is what's holding up all these other mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can preach you and tell you that God has so much in store for you, I can tell you about the promises of God that's waiting to be released over your life. But if I never get to you, then then you'll never see it. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like when you're talking about whether or not the church is how we see it. No, it's not because you've got a whole bunch of preacher A's and a very few preacher B's. And when everybody has um, this 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 gospel that's really self-centric and it's kind of like. Uh, you remember when Jesus was sitting around the table with the disciples uh, and, they were, and Jesus was getting ready to get up out of here. And the disciples are sitting there and they're arguing about who was going to be the greatest when when he left. It's like, you know, who's going to take over? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be the greatest? And all this other kind of stuff. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're having the wrong conversation. You're having the wrong. What you shouldn't be worried about is what can get ready to happen to y'all next. When I, Because he said to him, said the, it, the enemy seeks to see you as we. He said, there's something that's coming that's getting ready to happen to you that is going to be a, a very major factor, not just for you, but for everybody connected to you. He said, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail you so that when you come through this, you can go back and strengthen your brother. And so the thing is, is that we have a lot of people who are sitting around the table and they're talking about who's going to be next or what my calling is or what my gifting is or, you know, who's going to greatest or who's the God's general or who's going to be next if this person passes. And it's like we're having the wrong conversations because the enemy, like you said, he's always plotting and scheming. He's always under the attack. He's full time in what he does. But as long as we keep, you know, sitting around holding conversation about things that are trivial then we won't see what's really coming down to the, the totem pole. And if we don't, as the leaders don't see it, then we have a lot of casualties behind our, our ignorance and our arrogance. Yeah, I got a friend that was over my house last week. He's a pastor. And uh, me and him talk a lot because I, uh, I always tell him there's a difference between the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that there's a spirit of error that permeates all of the so-called church buildings mm -hmm. uh, when you, when it come down to church worship. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because of the way that it's been established in America. Right. Because really money has became the God of mm -hmm. the churches that we so-called go to a lot of times because we're so monetarily over here in America. Right. But if you go back to Melita over there where Paul got bit by a snake, uh, I met, had a friend from there and he told me he believed that 98% of, of Christianity was false. Mm. And only 2% real. Wow. He said, because over there, they still serve God in the same place they served him at because they're a third world country. 
Wow. You see what I'm saying? And they don't, they don't, they're not looking to build buildings. Mm -hmm. They're looking to build people. Yeah, that's and, it. And see, here's the problem. When you look at the spirit of error, it's taught from a different perspective. When you look at the word church, it comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Mm -hmm. It simply means to be called out from among them. Mm -hmm. But we've taken and established it as a building. Mm -hmm. And we tell people you have to go to it instead of be it. Yeah. And yeah. this is a big problem. Right. And people are not right. facing that. That's right. Because if they face that, then mm -hmm. they're when Corona hit, right. it wouldn't have affected them because right. we know that we are the church. Right. That's the Bible right. says, know ye not that your body is the temple and right. the spirit mm -hmm. dwells within you. Mm -hmm. So when you know these things and you understand these things, then you know how to fight your battles. Now, I'm not telling you that people shouldn't go and worship. I'm telling you people should have an understanding of how they should be right. worshiping. Right. That's and I it. think they're not being educated enough in we, these areas. It's, it's become more of a crutch than anything, man. And and we we've, we've taught and conditioned people to go and come instead of be. That's and it. that's the that's the issue. And and I tell people all the time, I said, you know, this pandemic was one of the biggest blessings that happened to the church. I gave it a thumbs up. And in in a long time because it, it, it removed us from the building and it required us to to go for to god for ourselves mm -hmm. it made you do it. And yeah but the problem was is that you had people didn't know how to do who it. didn't know how to handle it even leaders even pastors they were anxious <laughs> to get people back into the church we got to get people back in this building and, and, and so the problem is is that we have a lot of people who are conditioned to lean on church the building and they feel like if they don't get to the building, they didn't get God. And that's the problem. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. It's like, and so you hear people say things like, man, I, I got to get to church, man. I got to get mine. I got to do gotta this. I got to get in there. Yeah, but, and so the problem is, is that you get there, you have an experience of some sort, but you don't take from the place what you should take to take back with you. No, that's true. You know what I'm saying? Remember the story of Jairus? And um, Jairus is walking with Jesus, right? And he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, he says, look, I need you to go with me to my house because I know that if you go to my house with me, my daughter who is sick mm -hmm. will be made well. Okay, so they start progressing, they're going and whatever the case may be. And then they get he, they get inter interjected by the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus stop, he deals with her issue. By the time he gets done with her issue, here comes Jairus' servant and says, trouble not the master no more. She, she ain't just, but see what people miss is what Jesus really said. Because what he said to Jairus was that she wouldn't, he didn't say that she wouldn't die. He just said the sickness wouldn't end there. In other words, it could get worse. But the key to her deliverance and her miracle is whether or not you keep walking with me, even when you get bad news, because you're going to you're going to get interference, you're going to get distraction, and then you're going to get a bad report from somebody who's familiar with your situation. And you trust this person more than you trust me because you don't know me, but you know this servant, you know this servant enough to leave her home, leave this servant home mm -hmm. with your sick little girl. And so he comes and he says to him, he said, trouble not the master no more. And Jesus says something that was so profound. He says, don't doubt, just believe. believe. Because now Jairus has a, a he sees he has had a fork in a row, right? Because he has to make a decision. Do I trust the word of the one that I do know? Or do I trust the word of the one that I don't know, but who has the the the, the power, power and the authority to do something about? Because either way, Jairus had to go home, right? Mm -hmm. Either way, he had to go home. Whether it, it, but what made the difference was who he went home with, and that's the pop, the piece that people are missing when we're talking about because they feel like because they came to the church, they got it. No. The power is in what you take, even from the building. If you come to the building, fine. But did you take what you what, what was released in the building back with you? And 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 again, I, I, yeah, great story, great analogy. I love that story. That's one of the most profound stories in the Word of God. I love the issue of blood with the woman that comes and stops. And mm -hmm. I've always been fond of that story. Um, Jesus is the truth, you know. Right. <laughs> the way right. the truth and the life. Yeah. But, you know, um, man, just it's, it's just something else when you understand who God really is. That's you know right. what I mean? And people that go to whatever 
and don't have no, you, you haven't emptied out. Right. See, you have to let go of some things in order to grow. Right. You can't grow if you all, you still holding on to those things that hold you back. That's right. So we already know that people are coming in and they're tired and they want to change. Mm -hmm. But when they get there, a lot of times the word that they're being given is it enough to give them that change that they desire? Right. Because of tradition and the spirit of error instead of the spirit of truth and all these different things, the innuendos that we see people dealing with. And I say that because we just have to do better when we do get those people in the front of us mm -hmm. to try to give them God's word. Yeah. Take that time, no matter where you're at, really, because I, I, I believe you can worship where you stand. Right. But. Take that time to get those people in a situation where you challenge them with the truth in the word of God. So many people are speaking on the world instead of the word. And that's the problem, man. Realistically, you got to spend time with God in order to have that word. And that's the biggest issue that we're facing right now is that you got a whole lot of people who have the microphone, but don't have the work ethic, which that's means right. they didn't spend time with their word. They didn't spend time in his presence to even know what God is saying, you know, for a time such as this. And so you see a lot of preachers that are preached trendy things like when the crate challenge happened, all the preachers wanted to preach about the crate challenge. When the red flags happened, all the preachers wanted to preach. And so our 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 main vein as the church right now is more reactive than proactive. It's true. It's being led by the trends rather than the word of God, because at the end of the day, when if preachers were truly spending time with God, we would foresee some of these things that are happening. We had really true prophets operating in the kingdom of God. We would have, we would have, we, we were, would have been better prepared for this pandemic. And so it's like, it's like, there's, like I said, there's a lot of people that got the microphone, but ain't nobody studying. Ain't nobody spending time with it. We're, we're regurgitating word that we heard, you know, our, 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 our you know, spiritual father or whatever the case may be, be preach, whatever the case, but nobody's really spending that time. Nobody's really getting in his face and giving God that devotion that they need to actually hear from people. Because if you are truly hearing from God, I honestly believe that half the words that you hear being preached would not be being preached because it's not what God is saying in this season. I mean, really, realistically, when you're talking about a whole world that is shut down, that needs something of significance for their life to even recover. When you're talking about a community, especially a black community, even though we see that the world is opening up and all this other kind of stuff, our community is still struggling. It's still suffering. It's still going to, it, it's still a pandemic for us. For so many people, there's so many people who are still without jobs, who need jobs, who still, their income is not risen. Their unemployment has canceled out. And so the needs are really great. And, and, and here's how I know for fact that the church was not on par when it came to people's needs in the midst of this, of this pandemic. How do I know this? Because when God took us out of the building, we poured more money into the building, mm -hmm. even though the building was empty. <laughs> help, that, help me make sense of this. All your people, or at home in your community struggling. They have needs that need to be met. And you sitting here gloating about, well, we did this to the building so that when y'all get back, it's gonna be, you know, X, Y, and Z. And it's like, no, you got churches that are sitting in communities that have been sitting in communities for 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years that communities don't even know exist because they have not tried to make an impact in that community. Mm -hmm. And so we were so not on par with what, was, what God was trying to show us. He was trying to show us that we put, like you said, we put more emphasis on the building than we do the people. And the people suffer because of it. And, and you know, you, you, you say a mouthful, you know, and, and, and thank you for, for, for that. You know, the, the, the difference is, what do we do? You know, what the, what's the game changer? Mm -hmm. You know, we know what the word of God say. The Bible says, what would to the preacher that go and say, God said, the prophet that go and say, God said, and he ain't said nothing in the book of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. We know that a lot of times there's, uh, 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 it says, uh, should not the shepherd feed the flock? Also, you know, when he say, woe to the shepherd that feeds himself and not the flock. Mm -hmm. Should not the shepherd feed the flock? Oh, also in Ezekiel. So what am I saying? I'm just telling you that where do we start to change the narrative? 
Or do we want to just fit in? Like when Dr. King said in Birmingham, when he was in Birmingham jail, Dr. King said that, you know, the church, the clergy has become a, 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 like it's a non-sounding symbol, like they just accept things as they are. If you go back and read that, that Birmingham letter, you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So when you really look at, um, you know, what was going on during that era, you know, far as uh, when King said that. I believe we still have a lot of face challenges. We got to try to figure this out in a way to where we don't do that. Right. We're not helping our youth, man, if we're not going to our youth. That's right. We're not helping our communities if we're not going to our communities. Right. I believe the church passed the church up going to the church. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem. That's it. So I'm being real. I, I like we what have you said change, right there. The man. church passed the church going, going to the to church. The church. Yeah. You can't yeah. do it like that. And that's, that's right. the problem. So anytime. And this is something I challenge all the leaders with in my community when they talk to me. We got to do something. Right. I don't just do nothing. Right. If you right. want to do something, come get me. But until That's you're right. ready to do something, right. Right. I don't want to go into church and celebrate with you. That's right. I'm being real. That's right. I am the church. That's it. So I don't have to go to something that I am. That's right. I'm telling you, when you're ready to go serve the community, That's then right. I'm ready to go with you. Mm -hmm. But if you're just sitting around telling each other stories and acting as if you're motivating each other and you say you're saved, I don't have time for that. Right. That's right. That's I'm right. sorry. That's it. We got to help somebody. If you call me, uh, JC, and say, hey, uh, e, we got some children that we need to feed. E, we got some children that we need to clothe. E, there are some homeless people we want to put some backpacks out for. I'm all for it. Right. But when you're sitting around and you know you're seeing problems, you passing them by just so you can satisfy your own desires mm -hmm. in your flesh. That's right. I have no time for that. That's right. I'm I being real. That. I feel that. But, but, but we got to do something, though. I got to do something. I can't just say that and then don't do nothing. That's right. So we have to try to come up with ways to be strategic enough in the communities mm -hmm. to help the people. Right. But we, we've seen this process that the. We, you know, people don't turn their back on the church a lot of time. Right. All of my friends are saying they don't go no more a lot of time. Right. I'm being real. Right. Because they've been hurt by those places, mm -hmm. man. When it came time to pay bills, they paid tithes, but they couldn't even get a, a, a helping from the people that they right. paid tithes to. Right. Right. They lost homes, man. Right. They they was in debt. That's right. So how do you justify that as a people? We got to change, man. Yeah, absolutely. We got it. We got to come out of that, man. And <laughs> it's tradition. It, 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 it is. It, it, and it's it's a sad tradition, man, because, you know, what people are going to have to realize is that ministry is bigger than, you know, turkeys and, 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 and school supplies. You know, people got real needs around the clock. You know, one of the things that I used to love um about the church when i was growing up and this was even more prevalent even in the times before i got here is that you had access to the church yeah you had access you know there was a, at any given time you can go up to the church and somebody was there mm -hmm. you know whether whether it was the cleaning crew or the pastor or whatever the deacons or somebody was there nowadays you can't even get in the parking lot because it's, it's chained and all this other kind of stuff there the church has, a, a, has has fallen in love with this idea that, you know, Sunday is it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not it at all. Yeah. And so, you know, and you look at look, even when how, how at how people build buildings, you know, when the church has to build a new building and all this other Loving kind of it. stuff, yeah. you can look at and say, oh, you know, we're doing great mm -hmm. things because, you know, now we need a 10,000 seat sanctuary and all this other kind of stuff. But the ministry component. And, and this was people fail to realize is that more people do not equate more ministry. That's right. More seats do not equate more ministry. It's that's not how this thing works. You have spent a minute part of your budget on actual ministry, but you have been spending 10 million dollars a year on the sanctuary and the edifice and the worship service and the musicians and the uh, singers and then this big production and all this other kind of stuff. And it's like, that's not what God intended. You know, we got to get out of this mindset that because we're having a good time on Sunday and because twice a year you can see us in the community doing things, you know, you know, like toys for Christmas or school supplies or turkey that's, drives. That don't mean nothing. No, not that's, just that's, during the holiday. That, that's, that's, you know, that, that, it's a lifestyle, that ain't man. changing nobody's life. You got people who are out here dealing with domestic violence and drug addictions and uh, mental illness and all this other kind of stuff. Where is the church in this capacity? Hey, and I agree with that. This is, this is where we need to be active at. This is where we need to be mobilizing people. Mm -hmm. 
It's not about, I, I, I don't, I could care less if you volunteer for the turkey drive, but you are a licensed counselor. Can you help us minister to the needs of some people's mental illness and mental deficiencies? Or you are a licensed educator. We got some struggling people who are in this public school system who are struggling to get their grades up to par so they can graduate. Can you volunteer your time yeah. so that we can so that we can provide some tutoring services as a, as a body of believers? Because we've got to begin to show up in people's real needs. That's the, at the end of the day. That's what it's about. If the church is not meeting needs, then we are not fulfilling our purpose. J.C. Wallace, guys, he's in the building. Um, man, I, like I said, I appreciate you for coming on the show. Um, you know, the thing, uh, if I was going to end it a certain way, it would be when I read the Bible and you know me, and this is not a heresy. You hear me? This is not a debate. This is not a, a, a what they call it uh, when you uh, when you when you when you say things and then oh man you know no this is something that's real for me. Mm -hmm. um, when I read the Word of God, I read a fulfilled word in the New Testament mm -hmm. where Jesus says, I, "I didn't come to destroy the law; I come to fulfill it." That's right. He say uh, he, he he also you, you know he say things like he went over here and he did that so that that would be fulfilled. Uh, Jesus showed us and, and, and he, why he went through certain places. He went to Egypt when he was a baby to fulfill something in the old covenant, mm -hmm. you know. But I think a lot of times in today's society, our teachers, our preachers don't read the word of God in a fulfilled format where we understand the old, the old covenant was the old covenant. But Christ had to come. There was no salvation in the old covenant. Mm -hmm. Without Christ, there's no salvation, brother. All right. That's right. Do you understand that? That's right. He said he, be, he came to send well, his only begotten son mm -hmm. so that whosoever would believe in him will not perish. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have to send him if there was salvation already. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say, I look at our people and I look at our teachers, our ministers, and they don't teach a fulfilled word. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what That's I'm right. saying? Right. Showing that Jesus Christ came and the curtains rent mm -hmm. and things happened in the New Testament that fulfilled the old covenant. That's right. That Yahshua was Jesus in the New Testament, that jo that Joseph was a form of Jesus in the New Testament. And, and he, they all was even when the rock got smit by Moses is a form of Jesus in mm -hmm. the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people try to go back to these ways that things happen in the old covenant mm -hmm. and try to establish our people. Right. And I don't think that's the way, bro. Well, see, the thing is, is that and I, I, I have this conversation um, with some of my pastor friends all the time. When Jesus left us as a as a church, one charge, he said to his disciples, he said, go and teach them the things that I taught you. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about this fulfilled word, that's everything right. that Jesus showed them was in fulfillment. That's and right. so we look at what Jesus taught them. He taught them to love. They taught them to care about people's needs. He taught them to be concerned about their neighbor and their brother. And he taught them about uh, be, uh, 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 being sacrificial in our giving and all this other kind of stuff. These are the things that Jesus taught. He didn't say, go make more prophets. He didn't say, go make more apostles. He didn't say, go make, he said, no, go make more disciples. And I'm not saying that to negate the 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 uh, the necessity for prophets, apostles, teachers, and all that kind of stuff. What I'm saying is, is that these were supposed to be additives, not alternatives. And so, what what we have here is that we got people who are literally establishing ministry to make more prophets or make more apostles or whatever the case may be. He said, no. He said everything. Whether it be a prophetic or a discernment or whatever the case may be, it's supposed to be help fulfill the charge that I've given you to make disciples. That is your primary objective. And that is what we as a church have gotten away from. We've stopped making disciples. We, we've made church people. We know how to church. We got that down pat. I can church any day of the week effortlessly and it changes nothing. But what Jesus taught them and showed them was to, the, about the communal concern that we are supposed to have for one another. And so you saw Jesus feed the sick, uh, feed the feed the hungry. You saw Jesus heal the sick. You saw Jesus make the blind to see. These are all the things that you've seen Jesus do. And he says in, 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 in seeing these things, what I want you to understand is that this is the stuff 
that I want you to really take ownership of and understand that what I'm showing you is that your obligation as a disciple of mine is to be concerned about other people's needs. Mm -hmm. that, that is the primary objective. I've given you no other directive. I've, given, I've told you to do nothing else. I, all I've told you to do was go teach the people what I've taught you. Go make more disciples. Wow. J.C. Wallace, man, he's in the building, man. Hey, man, I want to first of all tell you I love you, brother. Love I'm you so too. glad that God brought you our way. Um, uh, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, in, in you here in Atlanta. Yes, I'm here in Atlanta. How can people get a hold of you if they wanted to reach out to you and they needed help? I'm, I am J.C. Wallace on all social media. You can type in I am J.C. Wallace on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I just uh, started a TikTok. I don't know hey, what I'm going to do with hey. it yet, but it's going to be something. Um, but I am J.C. Wallace, or if you need to reach What's, out to the ministry, it's yeah. I am I am the one dot church. Okay, I so am is, the is one this online church. only, it's, or is this so something? we're online and in person? You yes. have you, you yes. have you have a uh, a location that you guys? Uh, yes, yes, where yes. Is it we at? we are in Riverdale. We hold services. Uh, our my good friend lets us use because we church on Friday nights. Okay. Yeah, it's we dope. yeah I like we, it. yeah we church on I Friday like nights. I figured if we can impact Friday nights, we can impact the city. So we church on Friday nights, six thirty five Denham. I like that Denham in uh, Riverdale, Georgia. Hey man, you guys heard that man? If you if you want to put down, hey hey, if you want to put down some real put down on Friday night, man. Uh, yeah yeah, cut back on going to Strokers or or yeah yeah yeah, or Blue Flame and go on and go over there and hang out with my boy. Stop playing, man. Yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're the original King of Diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say, I, def I definitely I definitely thank you for coming on the show man you're for a blessing sure, man thank you for and, having um, me if, if there's anything that we can help you with uh we're in Dallas Texas man and you're okay. welcome uh to uh give give us a call uh, I want you to follow our platforms and uh Absolutely. Just uh, just link up with us if it's anything we can help with. If you're doing a, a food drive or something where you're doing, we do clothes, whatever. Hit me up, man. Let's Absolutely. try to do something together. We'll we'll get it popping right down here. Absolutely. Thank well, you I so much for coming you. on Thank the show, so man. JC Wallace, guys, man. Hey, man, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. And we out.